Book Tea. Welcome back to my channel. Welcome to my Sunday evening reading experience. I asked you guys to pick three books from my TBR to read today, and you picked. I got Winter by Ali Smith, Can't and Won't, Stories by Lydia Davis, and Blindness by Jose Saramago. I just uploaded a short video where I shared how the books were chosen. I used a random number generator from the internet, and it came up with three numbers, 9, 6, and 16, and these were 9, 6, and 16 on the list of books that you guys had chosen. When I started thinking about this video, the original intent was to read all three books in the day of Sunday. But I got a late start. I had club this morning with my youth group kids, and so I didn't get started until about 2 o'clock, which means I'm not going to be able to read all three books in Sunday evening, but over the 24-hour period, I plan to. Right now, my plan is to give you six updates. I'm going to stop midway and tell you what I'm liking about the book so far, or maybe what I'm not. And at the end of each book, I'll give a short synopsis of what the book was about or what resonated or what didn't about each one of the reads. So that's the plan right now. I'm going to be starting with Winter by Alice Smith because this is my most anticipated of these books. These are from my library. This is from the New York Public Library. I need to return it pretty soon. So if this experiment fails and I only complete one of the three books, I want this to be it. So we're starting with this one and at my next update, I'll probably be at the midway point in the book and I'll tell you what I'm thinking about it so far. So stay tuned. So I'm in the middle of my reading challenge. It's Sunday evening and I started with winter and I'm still reading it. I'm afraid that I won't finish my three books in a day. Winter has about 320 pages, and right now I'm at page 146. The story's about a woman named Sophia. Um, her son is going to come to visit. Her son's name is Arthur, but he's shortened it to Art, and he has a fascination with Winter. When Art and his girlfriend Charlotte break up, Charlotte hacks his Twitter page, and she's been sending these messages, posting these messages, impersonating him online and ruining his plans for what he's going to write about winter. Sophia, who's Art's mother, she lives alone, and it seems like she's having some kind of a mental breakdown. Maybe she has a tumor. She thinks maybe she's seeing things, so she goes to the optician, and her optician says it's like her eyes haven't been used because they're in such great condition for her age. To think that Sophia has lived this long and not seen things means that maybe she hasn't been allowing herself to notice the things that have been happening around her. So there's that as a reference. However, she's been seeing this vision, a face without a body, a face without connections. And whatever it is that that means, I guess will be revealed later. But as it approaches Christmas, Sophia starts having these dreams, which are a nod to Dickens's Christmas Carol. When Arthur and his girlfriend, when they arrive, they notice that Sophia is having some kind of an issue. And so even though Sophia and her sister Iris have been estranged, Iris is the one that they bring in. And so I'm at the point where Iris has just arrived. So I'm about halfway in the book, so we'll see how it works out. So I finished reading Winter, and I think I like it. I'm not sure that I like it as a novel, but there are a lot of things about this writing that I really enjoyed. Alice Smith has a way with words. She does a lot of really clever word plays. Like, she starts the book with a Dickensian reference about God being dead, but that's a line from The Christmas Carol, which she refers to a lot in this book, because this is a book about winter, and Christmas is one of the most definitive characteristics of winter in our experience in this part of the world or in this in this culture. So the book starts off with Arthur's musings. Arthur is one of the main characters in the book. We also read from the perspective of his mother, Sophia, Iris, his aunt, and two women named Charlotte. One who's the real Charlotte, who we don't really meet. The other Charlotte is the woman that Arthur pays to impersonate her. So you know one of the definitive aspects of the Christmas Carol is when Scrooge is visited by the ghosts of Christmas past and Christmas future. And in this novel, the author moves around time and space to help show these characters remember things from their past 
and how it is affecting and impacting not just their present but also the present of the people that they're in relationships with. Winter is not a very plot driven novel, it's more a collection of moments showing the author's perspective on very recent political events including the United Kingdom exiting the EU in the what's called Brexit as well as the election of President Trump in the United States and how his media interaction is being viewed by people all around the world. So there were things that I liked about this book. There were things that were very timely and very relevant and very significant in the way the author spoke directly to us. Like there were moments where the one of the characters wanted to tell a story but she changed her mind because she didn't want to reveal so much personal information. But the author told the reader the story anyway. Alice Smith in this book plays with her relationship with the readers, kind of isolating us from the characters, like she's giving us a backstory. And then she does that as well with some of the characters. There are all these middlemen in the book competing for our affection, competing for our loyalty. And I felt like that was introspection on the world as a bigger picture. So the things that I liked most about this book were definitely the word plays. I liked seeing the puns. I liked the way the author named the characters. Like the character that we meet first is Arthur. He has a blog. I like that he was a writer. And his blog is called Art in Nature. Art being an abbreviation for Arthur, but also a nod to the role that Arthur is going to play in this book. Art because he's going to point us to some artistic references, but also because his blog and his Twitter, Art in Nature, because he's going to show us a little bit more about ourselves, not just nature as it relates to some abstract concept that we don't have any control over, but also our nature, our tendencies, our inclinations, the things that we do have control over and what we do to express ourselves. For now, I'm giving this a conservative four stars because I liked it but didn't love it. And I reserve the right to change my rating, whether increasing or reducing it, depending on how I feel about it later. So for now, moving on to Lydia Davis stories. This, I think, is going to be a good break, a good palate cleanser before I get to the next novel. These are very short stories. Most of them are just a few lines or a few paragraphs. I expect that this will be a good bridge between two pretty heavy novels. So talk to you more about this one later. So I'm about halfway through this collection of short stories by Lydia Davis. Most of them are very short. They're flash fiction, essentially. And they are humorous takes on very mundane, insignificant things. The author finding some philosophical quality to her musings about these random events, but expressing them with some literary quality that makes them pretty interesting. One of my favorites so far was A Dreadful Mukamas, which was about a couple that sublets a house and inherits this mother-daughter pair of housekeepers. The story is written from the perspective of the woman who is the mistress, and it describes the passive-aggressive reaction that she gets from these maids whenever she tells them to do something, how they hide the bell that she would use to summon them, how they shout and fight and say that things are unavailable so that they don't have to serve her. I thought it was a very interesting take on servitude, but also an allegory for colonialism in some way because these two women weren't actually in the employment of this mistress and her husband. They had actually been inherited, kind of. I'm looking forward to completing this, but I think I'm going to stop and move to my blindness novel because I think I've had enough of a break from winter to move on to the next novel. And I really want to read blindness now. So I'm moving on from this to this. I'm at page 100 in Blindness by Jose Saramago. Not quite the halfway point yet, but I want to stop and just tell you what it was about. The story starts off right away. The first paragraph, we meet this man who's driving his car. He's at a traffic light. And when the light changes to green and he starts driving, he stops the car, starts gesturing wildly, screaming out. So other drivers rush out of their car to go see what's wrong with him. And he reports that he can no longer see. Not complete darkness, but complete light. His eyes have been taken over with this milky whiteness, he says. A good Samaritan offers to take over navigating the car and to drive him home and to wait with him until his wife gets there. However, the good Samaritan helps himself to the man's car. When the wife gets home, she's so annoyed that someone could take advantage of her husband in that way that she swears on her own life that this thief should also become blind. And that's exactly what happens. But in the meantime, they take a taxi, they take this blind man, 
to the ophthalmologist and while he's there he has some contact with some patients in the waiting room as well as with the doctor. This case of blindness is one of the last things that this doctor sees because he's also struck with sudden blindness, him as well as all the patients in his waiting room and even this doctor's wife. As it becomes apparent that this wave of blindness is contagious, all the people who've become blind as all the people that they've been in contact with and who are considered to be contaminated are rounded up and put in this mental hospital with orders that they shouldn't leave their ward. And so they're being guarded by soldiers who are so afraid of contact with these blind people that any attempt to do anything that's out of the ordinary is considered to be a wave of terrorism and they're shot on sight. There's a line that Saramago uses to sum up what is happening in this book and he says there are many ways of becoming an animal. This is just the first of them. And that's exactly what seems to be happening as what starts off as a loss of basic sight becomes the lack of basic human kindness as people move from social interactions and altruism into primitive survival mode. So I'm gonna get back to reading and I'll tell you what I think about it when I'm done. reading this book and you can tell by the number of tabs how many quotes I marked and how deeply this book impacted me. This is a book that is going to challenge and elicit almost every fear and panic that you can summon about blindness, about loss of control, about what life is like when the rules no longer apply to the other people, rules that keep crime and criminals at bay and that protect us even if they restrict our freedoms. This is a novel that challenges all of that. In this one, Jose Saramago pits revenge against kindness, fear against love and hope, and strips every basic tenet of human decency away to see what people are like at their core, and challenges the reader to think about what life must be like when everything else has been stripped away, and only what is necessary for human survival is going to be allowed to persist. And so several times during the novel, the author pierces that veil and speaks directly to us as readers, challenging us to tear down those tenets that we believed in, really just to show us why they no longer exist in this hell that he has created, and how these horrors could just as easily happen to you, because isn't that the fear that we ultimately have to deal with when reading a book like this? This was a haunting epic story, made more so because of the lengthy paragraphs of prose, sense dialogue, free from the burdens of characters' names, but brimming with descriptions so vivid that it's a wonder these characters were able to stay blind in this experience. I'm giving this one my coveted five-star rating. I mean, you can tell by the number of tags in here how many times I'm probably going to refer to this one and quote this one. So it's Monday morning. I'm still within my 24-hour period, and so I'm going to push to finish the stories in this one, and I'll tell you what it's like when I'm done. Page 283, flash fiction entitled PhD. All these years, I thought I had a PhD, but I do not have a PhD. <laughs> in this collection of flash fiction, Lydia Davis tells you more about her thoughts than you probably ever cared. She goes through random things, like she'll tell you what she's doodling on a scrap of paper while she's talking to her mom. Her mom needs a new cotton dress, and when she writes the word cotton, she writes it first left to right, then she writes it right to left, then she jumbles the words. Yeah. She tells you that. The book is arranged in five sections. I'm not entirely sure what the theme of each section is, but she does spend a lot of time sharing some dreams as well as reflections on writings from Flaubert and giving her alternate take on what the characters in a Flaubert novel would be doing. One of the dreams is where there's a person standing at a train station and a monk approaches this character asking for directions. And this person, after telling the monk how to find the way, reflects on how ironic that is. So that's the kind of writing that is in this book. If this is indeed a novel or a diary of some character who is sharing with us her inner thoughts to show us who she is and her progression as we go through the book, then this is a person who is an avid letter writer. Everything that annoys her or irks her about products, she sends letters of complaint to the companies, and those are really funny to read. So this is one that I'd recommend for some light reading. This is the end of this experiment. I asked you to pick my TBR. You gave me some selections. We randomized. We got these three books, 
and Winter by Alice Smith. I like this. I gave this four stars. Blindness by Jose Saramago. I loved this. I gave this five stars. Even though it's not the kind of novel experience that you really love, it was just very profound and thought provoking. And then this one I'm going to give a three star rating. While it was easy to read through and ultimately pretty entertaining, I didn't quite get the point other than that. So that's it. Thanks for participating. Thanks for watching and thanks for allowing me to share this reading experience with you. I probably will do this again. Let me know if you'd be interested in doing this experiment with me again. And until next time, happy reading. Bye.